frantic, gruesome trench warfare realized across a generous assortment of intricate maps elevated by a time's jaw-dropping sound design yet grounded in an always admirable commitment to painstaking historical realism. Are you not entertained? Huh. Guess not. Beyond the Wire is a theoretically large-scale World War I multiplayer-only FPS set on the western front of the Great War. It's not as methodically paced as was the slower squad-based simulator Verdun, and it's certainly not as absurdly high-octane, authenticity be damned, as was Battlefield 1. Indeed, when you consider Beyond the Wire's, I suppose, unique middle ground pace of play, not to mention all the accolades I hurled its way at the video start, well, it begins to boggle the mind a bit on learning that almost without exaggeration nobody is playing it. It's not until you look beyond Beyond the Wire's in-game experience that everything starts to sadly add up. First, a $35 price tag. Not unreasonable given this game's production value, but impossible to stomach when you consider its non-existent player base. This is simple supply and demand, people. Hardcore World War I shooter is an already pretty niche market that Verdun and its sequel Tannenberg seem to have saturated. Doesn't help that Verdun just had a huge 75% off sale and its next installment, Asanzo, is coming out in two weeks. As far as I'm concerned, these two facts are like the slices of bread in a Beyond the Wire sandwich, meaning Verdun's developer M2H is probably about to eat Beyond the Wire developer Offworld Industries for lunch. But wait, I hear you say in an effort to distract us from the point of this video, isn't M2H also about to eat itself for lunch by further cannibalizing Verdun's player base with yet another World War I shooter? Yes, but I say in an effort to get us back on track. Unlike Beyond the Wire, Verdun and Tannenberg have dedicated AI, trusty bots that are always there to make a dead server feel alive. Though these bots are half as hard to kill as is a real player, they add undeniable, invaluable immersion to a game that relies on mass to generate its relentless, chaotic intensity. Meanwhile, I can't count on two hands how many sad, albeit hilarious little 1v1s I've had waiting for Beyond the Wire servers to fill up. Not that they ever do. As Offworld Industries recently and incredibly decided to remove bot support from Beyond the Wire's developmental roadmap for the foreseeable future, well, I think it's safe to say that whatever writing was already on this game's wall and permanent marker has officially been traced by hammer and chisel. I'm left with no choice but to award Beyond the Wire this channel's first ever one for value. If, despite this, you're still interested in, again, an otherwise very solid World War I shooter, please allow me to briefly review the rest of this game. Earlier, I described Beyond the Wire as hardcore. If you don't know what that means and are too afraid to ask, just think the exact opposite of Fortnite. There's no minimap, no compass, no hit markers, no kill confirmations, no kill cams, and no fun. Almost every gun is iron sights and almost every gun is bolt action. So if you already semi-suck at shooters, like me, and have never ever held a one-to-one -one KDA in your miserable life, I'm sure Beyond the Wire will strike you as a tad intimidating. To calm your nerves, I offer but two humble words. Trench Club. That's right, Beyond the Wire's close quarters combat system and utter lack of compact automatic weapons makes melee a very viable and very glee-inducing strategy for noobs and vets alike. Perhaps predictably, non-combat mechanics won't occupy much of your time in Beyond the Wire. You can trim barbed wire, set up sandbags, place rally markers if you're a commander, and advance the game's progression system and unlock various cosmetics. That's about it. As for playability, I get occasional frame rate lag pretty much regardless of settings, and most server spawn times skew a bit long. Other than that, no complaints. I can't say the same for the game's objectives. As is, Beyond the Wire only features two game modes, Assault, in which one team tries to hold sectors of a map while the other tries to capture them, and Frontlines, in which both teams try to capture them. The visuals in Beyond the Wire are a bit of a mixed bag. The lighting is stellar, the explosions are stellar-er, and environmental textures here range from okay to great. However, the animations can prove a bit janky, and blood splatters are distractingly cartoonish. Meanwhile, I don't have much to say about the game's soundtrack. There are maybe three motifs that play a few times per match, but certainly nothing memorable outside of a blistering bagpipey main menu theme. So, in conclusion, Beyond the Wire is as visceral as it is authentic, and would certainly be worth your time if anyone decided it was worth their time. But hey, who knows what the future will bring? Offworld Industries might surprise us with a free-to-play pivot, or bots, or both. There are many ways to bring Beyond the Wire back from beyond the grave, and this game deserves it. But until then, Beyond the Wire earns a conflicted aggregate mega score of 3.1 out of 5. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.